University of California and Santa Cruz. And uh, he's going to talk about from micro microorganism to the three body problem. Can you hear me? <coughs> yeah? yeah? Fine. Not too loud. And um, one hour? Okay. Daryl, if you would wave to me when it gets to the hour so I don't. Okay, I'd appreciate it. Okay, it's great to be here. This talk will be a little bit different. I'm going to go back in time to when I was a grad student, and this was happening. Uh, I don't know how each person's life was, but this was very exciting for me. I tend to think that each generation has their own thing to get really excited about. So Donaldson established the existence of an exotic R4 and did a lot of other things. And it was based, a key ingredient was work of Taubes. It, was, it rested on work of Taubes and topologist Michael Friedman. And a key ingredient for Taubes was understanding instantons. And he had to glue these. So, so Donaldson's proofs, proof is amazing. It involves uh, attaching a solution set to a family of PDEs to a four manifold. So you have to understand those PDEs. And to understand the PDEs, you have to have at least some special solutions. And one of them is the instanton. And I'm one of these guys who tends to like exact formulas. So I could latch my hand on the formula for the instanton, uh, which was discovered by Tuhuft. So those are some precedents of all this. So that was really exciting. That's what I wanted to do as a graduate student. OK, so to understand the instanton, you want to first understand hop vibration. So one way to think of the hop vibration is a bunch of little spiral staircases attached to each point of the sphere. So these are the circles. These are the fibers. Um, I'll draw a picture that almost any book with connections has on it. So here's a little loop on the sphere. And if I start at a point here and I travel horizontally, I come back to here. And the amount. I traveled, we call the holonomy. And uh, can you see over here? OK. And the holonomy is a, pro is a proportional to the area of the shaded region. OK, so there's a little picture of the hop vibration, all these little planes all over the place. Um, and then the mathematical formalism. We have S3 inside C2, and S1, the circle group, acts. And the quotient is S2. So you see, for, you see little picture, little things like this in books with a hop vibration. Probably most people know the hop vibration. OK, so um, here's a question for you. So say hello to your partner, your tutor, your partner is Val. Everybody talk to their partner. You there, you need a partner. I'm serious. We're going to do this. We're going <laughs> to come on. Everybody go. Find a partner. You, you're ready. OK, ask your partner that question. <laughs> go on. I'm not kidding. I'm going to walk up and down because everybody's going to have to wake up and stop doing their email. You have a partner? Go on, ask. You have to ask. You have to do this. Ask. The, here's your partner. Have you asked? I'm not, I'm not going to stop till you do this. You've talked to your partner? What did your partner say? She says no. Okay, this person says no. 
She says, no, so this person is not a Platonist. Did anybody say yes? He sa Cesar says yes. Cesar says yes. The, the, the uh, hop vibration exists even if there's... I'm totally with Cesar. I'm a Platonist. These things exist. It doesn't matter if there were people were ever around or not. This is, this is not math, huh? <laughs> so I've been talking to a literature professor who finally got me to read Moby Dick, and he just thinks I'm incredibly naive that I would think these things exist. But for me, they exist. Okay, let's go back. What's the quaternionic hop vibration? Well, you just replace... S1 with its quaternion, or you just do everything over the quaternions, huh? So we're going to replace uh, C2 by H2. Inside H2 is a seven sphere. And now the unit quaternions, which is the same as SU2, they act. The quotient is S. Four. Now, where does the connection come from? Well, if you like formulas, there's a formula here. Let's write down the formula, connection. The connection form is imaginary part. Let's do it here. Let's put the connection form here. Imaginary part of Z1 bar dz1 plus Z2 bar dZ2 over the magnitude of the little complex vector. There you go. So that's the formula for the connection form for the hop vibration. What is it? It's, the, it's saying what horizontal is. Horizontal is perpendicular to vertical. Perpendicular relative to the standard metric here. There's a formula for it. I like formulas, so now you know what the formula is here. Everybody can replace complex numbers by quaternions. You just put quaternions here, huh? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, what else can you do? You're in the world of quaternions. So this is the instanton in uh, global coordinates on S7. Now, this thing is in here. I can quotient this by the circle, and I get R3. R3 is C2 mod S1, and I could quotient this by SP1, and I would get here an R5. If, so this is going to be H2 mod uh, SP1. Yeah. Question? Okay, so if I, have two, if I have two little quaternion guys, Q1, Q2, then I act on them by a unit quaternion, by unit quaternion scalar multiplication. So that's the quotient procedure. Okay? Okay. So this is the, this is the in some version or another, this is the Tehuft instanton. Um, and kind of the first non-trivial example in math that I felt like I understood. So, I was, uh, before I met Jair, uh, let's do the abstraction, huh? Let's just get abstract. I like to be abstract here. So we have a Q, okay, but a Q with a metric. We have a G that acts on it, and that is, for me, the, the way to think of a connection. Just that. And now there's an obvious thing to do. You look at the group orbit. You take a point Q0. You look at the group orbit. What's horizontal? Just perpendicular to the fiber. That's all horizontal means. So you have a quotient. I call it S. Okay, and then you have all these problems about, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a manifold. So we just, you just assume this acts freely. 
It doesn't act freely over zero here. It doesn't act freely here. We just suppose it acts freely. And then looking into the future, I call this shape space because, well. Okay, so that's the abstraction, huh? Now, in the, what the physicists did, what the gauge theory, they vary the connection, huh? That's like varying the metric in a certain way. We don't do that. We say mechanics somehow gave us this, this metric, it's kinetic energy, and we just have one connection. Why do we use the word gauge theory? Well, you could do computations in different ways, using different gauges. So that was uh, my thesis. And then Jair came along. And so this was after my thesis. So let me try to explain how I'm really organizing this talk. Okay, this is Jair's timeline. This is me. And uh, we had some interaction. And, uh, we had, and so for me, there was two interactions. Good, did a certain point in my early career, Jair really changed my direction. He, um, I was at MIT, kind of at loss of things to do, and he told me this crazy science fiction story. He said, you can use gauge theory to understand how microorganisms swim. And I thought, this guy's crazy. I mean, I did. I thought you were like one of the science fiction story. But there are these physicists that I'd never heard of, but people have heard of them now. Shapiro and Wilczek, who wrote the first article, the one that Jair showed me. And um, yeah, the, I mean, he run, this guy won a Nobel Prize, so he must be serious. Um, Anyways, they wrote this wonderful book, Geometric Phases in Physics, and there was a period uh, where we worked a lot on these kind of things, and there were conferences here, and we had a conference in Cornell, the famous Impanema postcard one, yeah? So, so this got me into, whoop, 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 this got me into this problem. So Shapiro and Wilczek got me into this problem, the falling cat, so, let's see. What do I want to tell you about the falling cat? Did you draw that? I did draw that. I did. That's, yes. Okay, so the, the analog of these formulas here is the uh, connection form, is the angular momentum, divided by the moment of inertia, or if you want to think of things as matrices, it's like this. So let me talk a little bit about this and why, yeah, let's just talk a little bit about this for a second. So I want to do one derivation. Maybe this is not a good thing to do in a talk, but we're going to do it anyways. So let's check that Angular momentum zero is equivalent to being perpendicular to the group orbit. So we'll check that. We'll do the computation. So we'll use the, the model where the cat is just a bunch of mass particles. So the kinetic energy is this. Well, that's the kinetic energy. So I'll write this. This is an inner product. So what I want you to think of is a whole bunch of masses. You've put a whole bunch of masses all over the, pot, the, the cat. So I've triangulated the cat, but I'm not taking the faces. I'm just taking the masses. And um, I have velocities each mass. And that's the, kinet that's the thing that twice that, if, right? This is a thing that kinetic energy is one half V inner product V, right? So it's a kinetic energy inner product. And now what I want to do is uh, look at what, what I want to do is I want to form a, I'll call it delta Q. 
So I'm going to rotate a cat. How do I, how do I rotate a cat a little bit? The eighth particle gets, this happens to the eighth particle. That's the, this is just in R3, huh? Omega's in R3. So everything's in R3. Just a bunch of masses in R3. So this is, would be in, doing an infinitesimal rotation of the cat. So we want to understand this relation, V delta Q equals zero for all omega. So we just want to do that computation. Huh? So we want to say the velocity is perpendicular to the infinitesimal rotations. I'm computing, here's the delta Q, I'm computing what the condition is on V and just checking. I don't know. I don't know. They always tell you not to do this kind of thing on the board, but I'm going to do it. I like simple, easy computations. So here you go. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do MA VA dot QA cross omega, and we're supposed to set that equal to zero, right? Yeah? Um, well, maybe I won't do it on the board. There's a simple cross product identity, huh? So up to a sign that I'm not going to worry about. I think it's a plus sign. This is MAQA cross VA dot omega. Agreed? Okay, well now the omega doesn't depend on A. Right? And this has to be true for all omega. So this thing has to be zero. Okay? So the angular momentum is zero. Okay, so the cat falling, modeled this way, is moving perpendicular here. Let's do the same computation another way. Do I really want to do this? Sure, I'm going to do this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this picture into a little, so I'm doing the same computation abstractly. So this map here, I just take G and I apply it to a particular point Q naught. Here I project that to the shape space. So that's my Q. And of course, this is, I don't know what you call it, an exact sequence of sets or something. Let's differentiate it, huh? If you differentiate this, you get zero G tangent bundle at Q naught of Q, tangent bundle to the shape space at the, the projected point, the projected shape, and zero. Okay, so you've got an exact sequence. I'm going to call this map sigma Q naught. <clears throat> so this is the infinitesimal generator. This put in a Lie algebra tells you what the vector field is at that point. It's a linear algebra thing. This is the differential of the projection. Okay, so we use the star. We take the dual of everything. So this is still an exact sequence of vector spaces. Now, <clears throat> what are we trying to understand? We're trying to understand what it means to be perpendicular to the group orbit. Perpendicular to the group orbit is the same as perpendicular to the image of sigma Q naught. Well, linear algebra 
the, the, the image of sigma Q naught perp is the kernel of sigma Q naught transpose. What does sigma q naught transpose here mean? It means use the metric. We have a metric. Here use the killing form, say. Okay? So you identify these two spaces. <coughs> sigma q of v transpose computation, that's the momentum map. The same formula we have seen probably 20 times in this thing. That's a momentum map. I've just written in different language. So you can check that that's a momentum map. So of course, if you want to be perpendicular to the group orbit, you're in the, you're in the kernel of the momentum map. So that's just an abstract version of this same computation. Okay, so enough for derivations, I think. I don't think I have any more derivations. All right. So I just did all that stuff. I did all this stuff. The metrics of kinetic energy, horizontal, is perpendicular. Horizontal is zero angle momentum. Uh, the group for the falling cat business or the microorganism is SE3 or SO3. Okay. Now, um, right around the time that Jair and I were really interacting, there was a, a, a great group going on, two groups that, that Alan Weinstein helped me get involved in, uh, a guy named Alex Pines, whose specialty is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and uh, electrical engineer Shankar Sastry. Uh, so there's pictures, uh, many of you probably know Richard Murray, so there were two kind of in one formal and one informal seminar going on, and Pines asked me during a meeting with Alan, what's the shortest loop with a given holonomy? Uh, he had an NMR application of it, and this ended up for me being a, just a great question. But we're at the time in my talk where I'm just going to skip the answer, and we're going to move to the end would you care to solve this, Richard? No, not, not now. If you're interested in the solution, uh, you can ask me after or what, you know, we'll talk, we can talk about that later. So I'm going to jump ahead now. This is a summary of my career. Um, Jair got me through this route, interested in microorganisms. They're too hard for me. Uh, Kurt Ehlers has worked on them, but I'm not much of a PDE guy. Falling cat, that's like an ODE type, I can do that. So falling cat, but that's too complicated. So I learned about this cane share model, and you think of it as two tin cans. But even that's complicated. So you know what, let's just have the cat be three masses. How about we do that? There's, there's a, uh, uh, you like the scallop theorem. There's a scallop theorem for cats. It's a cat consisting of two-point masses cannot flip over, okay? <laughs> but with three, you can. A cat consisting of three masses can flip over. And what happened is um, uh, that led me to the three-body problem. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the, the, the uh, part of the talk going from the, with the three bodies, okay? Yeah, let's talk about that. So, the configuration space for three points in the plane is three copies of C. So what I want to do quickly, well, I don't know quickly, we'll just do it. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to get from the three body problem to the hop vibration, okay? Something that I was lucky enough to learn as a graduate student. So we're going to go from the three-body problem to here. So let's remind ourselves how to do this.
So we draw our three points. And now, Jacoby had a beautiful trick for diagonalizing the kinetic energy metric. He said, take this vector, the one that connects 1 and 2, take the center of mass of 1 and 2, and connect it to 3. That change of variables diagonalizes the kinetic energy. Uh, you can restrict to the center of mass equals 0. So restrict to that subspace, then those two vectors that I'm going to call xc1 and xc2, those form a nice orthogonal coordinate system on, on the configuration space for the three-body problem, modular rotation. So I've just done the first line there. I divided by rotations. So what I did is I took c3 mod translations, and I got C2, but I don't want to just do it blindly. I want nice coordinates. So now I have the Jacobi vectors. And now I want to, uh, the symmetries for the three-body problem is rotation and translation. That's, uh, that's the ones I'm most interested in. So let's now divide by rotation. Rotation. Acts. It's probably... Cesar, can you see this? Acts by um, xc1, xc2 goes to e to the i theta, xc1, e to the i theta. So that's how rotation acts. If you rotate by theta, yeah, question? Yeah. Why, why are those nice coordinates? Because they diagonalize the kinetic energy. These di diag diagonalize kinetic energy energy restricted to this subspace. Another way to say it, if you, you could diagonalize kinetic energy with the total center of mass, three coordinates, total center of mass, and then two orthogonal to that. And if you want to diagonalize it, these are nice ones. There's others, but these are good ones. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so what do we have? We have S1 acting on C2. That was over here. Hello, Mr. Hopf vibration, huh? S1 on C2. That was a Hopf vibration. So we now know what the triangles, mod translation and rotation are. They're R3. They form R3. We want to go one step further to make nice pictures. We want to divide by dilation also. If I divide by dilation, to dilate the triangle, I just multiply by a real number, huh? That would be dilation by a real factor lambda, huh? So what we're talking about, what we'd like to do is C2 mod C star that's dilations and rotations. This doesn't work. Oops, that doesn't work. You'd get a bad quotient. But if you subtract out zero, it works great. And that's CP1, which you, should, you may also think of as the S2 of Hopf. And this I call the shape sphere. So that's the shape sphere. And um, here's a picture that Many people have seen before if they've listened to me talk. Uh, let me explain a little bit of the picture, and there's going to be another audience participation thing just about to happen. All right. So uh, the Lagrange point at the top, that's an equilateral triangle. Maybe, maybe we'll start now. Everybody make an equilateral triangle with their finger. Uh, come on, come on, come on, you in the green shirt. Up, up, up. There you go. Equilateral triangle with your finger. Okay. Right there. The points mass one, two, three, huh? One, two, three. Okay. Now, bring your fingers down like this, huh? Okay. You have just moved along a grade circle from the Lagrange point to an Euler point. 
You've just done it. Please do it with your fingers. There, you're at an Euler point. What's magic about it? Now, oh, let's do this on the Euler point. Let's move our fingers back and forth like this, huh? Okay, you are now moving along the equator. That's the syzygy equator, the collinear equator, okay? You think this is funny. You laugh, but you're going to understand it if you keep doing this. Okay, so we're moving back and forth on the collinear points. Okay, great. Okay, we're about ready to play the finger game. You ready? You can do it with your partner. Carlos and, and Daryl are going to help show us. Okay, now whichever one of you, I tried this with Kurt, and Kurt's a little bit arthritic from all his climbing, so he couldn't do it so well. So if your partner's more flexible than you, your partner will do this part. Okay, I'm going to do it with my fingers. Here we go. Three equal masses. Ready? You guys are pairing together. Hold your, oh, you have to film. You, come on, you're doing it too. I don't care. No, 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 no. It's easy with the thumb. There you go. Okay, all right, great. Okay, now, down. Ah, do you believe that's zero angular momentum? Sure. You're just going, you're going right down the bisector, huh? Okay, now move over here. Zero angular momentum, right? The masses are all equal. You agree? Okay, now we're going to go back up. This is where you can't be arthritic. The two points have collided up like that, huh? Yeah? It's a little tricky, but you Val did it. Show us that Val did it. Okay, now, Tudor, you don't move. If Tudor, <laughs> if Tudor doesn't move and Val does it the right thing, compare the triangles. Okay, compare the triangles. How much did your triangle rotate when you did that little loop? You started out with a triangle like this, huh? One, two, three, thumb, index finger, finger. Right? You started out like that. Did you end up like this? Yeah? Okay. Rotation angle, I get 30 degrees. 30 degrees? 30 degrees, huh? Okay, now. Now. Now for the, the magic, huh? Of 30 degrees. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we've all got the 30 degrees. Now, look at the sphere from the top. I'm going to project the sphere down from the top. Uh, we can erase this. No, no, it's just to get the idea of Hopf and the area formula. Yeah, I could do it for any loop, but I just wanted one to see. I just wanted to see one. So here's the loop you made, viewed from the top. You started out at an equilateral triangle. You move to the, the, the equators are collinear states. You went down here. You moved along. Here, your fingers were at mid, if they're supposed to be at the midpoints there. You moved along till two of your, your thumb and your index finger collided. Oh, let's draw the picture nice. Okay, so you went in a shaded area like that, huh? So that's one sixth of half a sphere. Agreed? One sixth of half of a sphere. I guess we did the group stuff. That's good enough. We did the group stuff. Huh? Okay. So one sixth of one half of a sphere. Right? So the area formula, there's going to be a multiplication factor. We're going to figure out what the multiplication factor is. We want to figure out what this k is. This is going to be our holonomy formula. So this is k times 1 6 times 1 half times the area of a unit sphere is 4 pi, yeah? So k over 1 third pi. Uh, but I don't want pi over 3. I don't want pi over 2, right? I mean, I, I want pi over 6. So you just gave a heuristic that k is a half. Okay? So the, the right multiplying factor, it's spherical area times a half. Times a half. Yeah? The, 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 ha the half is what gives you 30 degrees. That's, that, that's what I want. So this gives me the 30 degrees. Okay. 
Good. All right. So we've played around with the shape sphere. A question for the audience that, that Daryl and I talked about a little bit. Ah, so what I just did, I understood the Hopf vibration and holonomy from a mechanical point of view with the three-body problem. Very simple, you know, I don't know, we have a kin I don't know if you call it kinematics or mechanics, by kinematics. So anyways, we did the Hopf vibration. Can you give me a nice model of the instanton, the quaternionic Hopf vibration from mechanics? I mean, you can certainly artificially concoct one, that's easy, but does it come from some real place? I don't know the answer to that. They're always trying to make quaternionic fingers. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. So that's a question we'll leave. Uh, well, there's a few little ideas Daryl and I talked about, but. Um, Taub's motivation had nothing to do with this. <laughs> Taub's motivation. Taub's his advisor with Arthur Jaffe, and he was solving monop monopole type equations. And the next kind of place was to do instantons. And they knew exact formulas. And he was essentially the inventor of what's now called the gluing method. You can use a conformal group and take an instanton and shrink it. So it's very concentrated at a point. This is in a four manifold. So you think of it as space time. It's concentrated at an instant. And then you want to glue that exact instanton, kind of like soliton solution. You want to glue that into another four manifold. That was what he, that's what he did to prove it, basically proved existence and kind of understood infinity in the moduli space of solutions. That's what his work was about. Thanks. Okay, so now we change gears. And uh, this is the second, if you remember, I had a Jair like a spiral, huh? And me coming and hitting. And another time I interacted with Jair, that it really affected my research was him explaining to me Jacobi Mapertui and a paper of Seifert. And uh, this had to do with your thesis, is that correct? And uh, Alan, I believe, told him the reference of Seifert. And uh, I got, I don't read German, unfortunately, but I had a student translate it. So if you want to look at that, it's on my web page. It's a wonderful paper. So I want to tell you a little bit about this work, uh, uh, how Jacobi Mapertui might interact with the three-body problem for the remainder of the talk. Um, yeah. But we're going to have a commercial break. Uh, I was reminded again by Daryl of these famous postcards uh, where Jair convinced us all to come to Rio for a conference. And it worked. It was really wild. It worked. He got about 20 people to come. So it's taken me 30 years or so to adopt some of his methods. Um, we, Mark Levy and I are running something called the Idea Lab at Brown um, through the help of Serge Tabachnikov, who has a job there. Um, it will be in August, August 11 to 15. It's only for young researchers, you and the green. Only people five years out, the idea, what do they say, the idea? I've never done this before. I don't know what's going to happen. But it says senior researchers, that's me, will introduce topics and tutorials and lead discussions. Participants will break into teams. Well, you did that already. And brainstorm, comprehend obstacles, explore possible avenues. Teams will be encouraged to develop a research program proposal. It sounds exciting, doesn't it? Okay, well, we'll see what happens. Some of you, please apply. I don't know how many spots there are. There are at least five. Maybe there's 20. Ah, and look at this. The topic, one of the topics, toward a more realistic model of ciliated flagellated organisms. I don't know these people running this. I don't know anything about that part. I'm in the other part. High frequency vibrations in Ramanian geometry. Mark Levy does that. They'll have me do something. I don't, I'm sure they'll, I'll do something. So apply if it interests you. End of commercial break. Thank you, Jair, for that wonderful idea. Ah, here we are back at the three-body problem. Okay, so we are going to try to use Jacobi Mapertui uh, and the three-body problem. So I need to give you some of the basic functions 
Uh, well, they're all written up there. I think everybody knows them, but I'll just say them out loud. It's like how we do our little, like they do the mass in, in the church. Yeah, we say these words at every talk. Uh, kinetic energy, there's the formula, you all know it. Potential energy, well, I use a negative of potential energy. I'm a bit perverse, that's the way I like it. So the negative potential energy is po a positive quantity in the three body problem. Uh, I would like to put an exponent alpha in there. So it would be one over r to the alpha. And Enrique Pujols and I have been talking about what happens as you vary alpha. But right now I'm going to talk about we're just going to do the Newtonian problem. The energy is kinetic minus potential. There's another quantity that some of you are less familiar with. The total um, moment of inertia. Let me draw it on the picture of the, of the sphere. The total moment of inertia. Remember the quotient space is R3. That's the space of oriented congruence classes of triangles. This distance, how big a triangle is, is measured by the square root of the moment of inertia. That's like the radius. And there's the angular momentum. I wrote a wedge instead of a cross because I'm in two dimensions. So it's a scalar quantity. So those are the basic functions. And now I'm going to draw a picture. Rick Mokel is going to draw a picture. This is a picture from one of our papers. I want to explain the picture to you now. Um, same R3, the quotient, the shape space for the three-body problem. Um, right, this is in a, my recent collaborator is Rick Mokel, University of Minnesota, and Andrea Venturelli is at the University of Avignon, and we wrote a paper that has this picture in it. Uh, so what's the picture of? Okay, if you look at U, the potential, let's go back to the potential. There's U. U is homogeneous of degree minus 1. <clears throat> uh, right, so let's talk about the energy also. So if I look, if I have H, which is kinetic, minus potential, and I set H to H naught, and I solve, U is K minus H naught, huh? I want this to be negative. I want the energy to be negative, basically because that's the only time you have periodic orbit. So I want the energy to be negative. This is a negative quantity. This is a positive quantity. Wait a minute, I, did, I solved the wrong way. That doesn't, let me not try to, let me not, let me not try to do the algebra in front of the board. Let's just look at the picture. It says it right there. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just not do that. Let me let you do the algebra. Everybody's done this algebra. Let me not try to do it on the board. Okay, if you plot, fix the energy to be H naught. Figure out the possible, sh figure out the level sets of U. Let's do that that way first. What are the contours of U? The contours of U are plumbing fixtures like in um, Greg Huber's talk. What did you, where's, is Greg here? What did you call these things for your talk? You had this name for these. Three-way. Yeah. Yeah, those three. You throw a three-way. It's a three-way junction. This plumbing fixture thing, those are the level sets. As U goes to infinity, the junctions squish onto the three collision rays. Those rays there are binary collision. As U goes to zero, they expand out and start filling all of space. If you say, I'm going to fix the energy to be, say, minus one, then the motion has to live inside the junction. It has to move inside there. Okay. Now, when you, um, the blue, 
or I don't know if it looks blue to you. The darker thing is the is the syzygy plane in there. That's where the I'd like to call it collinearity. Collinear equals syzygy. I should write that down. I use the word syzygy a lot. I apologize. I wrote a paper where I, I, I prefer collinear, but I wrote one paper and the referee told me change all the instances of collinear to syzygy. That's what they call it in, mechan in celestial mechanics. They like syzygy for three things being in line. huh? So when if I say syzygy, it's collinear. Um, great. So I'm going to use that picture. Before I do, I still want to get back to this other interaction with Jair about Jacobi Mapertui. So v is, v is minus u. V is the potential. Yeah, V is the potential. So V and V is just minus U. Yeah. Let's see. Where's the rest of my talk? I always do this. Okay. Okay. Any questions? So to do Jacobi Mappertui and understand what it has to do with that picture, let's go back to Newton's equations. Let's have it with V. Okay, there's Newton's equations. And you can have the energy So in the three body problem, this is that the mass metric defined by the kinetic energy. And we all know how to change these things to P's and write down Hamilton's equations. And there's a Lagrangian So we have Hamiltonian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics, and then we have Jacobi Mappertui which goes like this. We know this is constant, so fix that constant. Call it H naught. And then this is the Jacobi Mopper Twi, a version of the Jacobi Mopper Twi principle. It says, take the standard metric, the one that gives you the kinetic energy. That's my symbol for the standard metric. Just the standard metric on R3, I mean, on whatever your configuration space is, given by the masses. Multiply it by this conformal factor. Then the, the principle says, it's a theorem. Geodesics for this guy. Our solutions to N, Newton's equation, reparametrized. And you can work out the reparametrization. The reparametrized solutions with energy H naught. So my understanding is that's the oldest variational principle around in mechanics. Uh, this is the Jacobi Mappertui way of doing things. Look for geodesics for this metric. And uh, you need that the conformal factor is positive. You don't want a negative conformal factor. You need that the conformal factor is positive. And when it equals zero, that set is that bounding surface there. That's the hill boundary. And what did that, what did, this is also sometimes called the zero velocity surface. Because the kinetic, I mean, all I did, this is just kinetic energy, right? 
If this is zero, that means the kinetic energy is zero. That means the velocity is zero. So things, if I fix the energy, things starting on the hill boundary are starting with zero velocity. No vol so, that, so if you start on that boundary, you've started with zero velocity. So you're dropping the three bodies. You're just letting them go. So we're kind of, we're, we're interested. What, what, these are called break orbits. I, I, I think a student of Allen's coined the term. So, the, so break because they stop, huh? So we're interested in existence of break orbits. That's a question we're interested in. Uh, maybe Jacobi Mappertui will give us some insight. So this is the first new one we found in this paper I just quoted you with uh, Rick Mokel. Um, it's a periodic break orbit uh, starting with isosceles. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll draw the picture on the shape sphere in a moment. So this is a funny subject. Okay, good. Thank you. So I started at 10 after the hour, right? 11 minutes, okay. So um, my subject is kind of weird. Let me try to explain why. Astronomers really could care less about this. I mean, no one expects a star system to look like this. So, so you know, if I talk in an astronomy, you know, I've done this. I've given talks like this in astronomy. They, they don't really care. I mean, it's cute, huh? So well, it's really art. So this is like Paul Clay, you know. That's what I mean. I'm doing art. I'm sorry. I, I'd like to be doing astronomy. Maybe someday, if I live long enough, I'll do a little. I'm doing art. Okay. So that's Paul Clay, huh? All right. So now Rick has a student named Nichia Chen, who made this solution, and I want to show you her some of her movies. You can look at them yourself. There's the website, but let's uh, let's get into Google here. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to do that. Um, escape. Google. There we go. Oh, oh, you know what? Why does that happen? Any any idea why I didn't? My friends here, can you get so what is on the screen to show? We don't just want to see a picture of me. It's just in a different part of the screen. Okay, great. Thank you. I can do that. Thank you. All right. All right. So here's some of her solutions. I just wanted to show you. And I'll, 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 I'll draw a little picture of... Huh? Yeah, I Yeah, you see, I mean... Uh, but they're fun, huh? Let's see, where did I go? I'm off the screen. I don't know how to... Got it. All right. You guys can go find yourself. She has uh, six infinite families, huh? <laughs> Someone give Jair a microphone. Go give, give, give Jair a microphone, please. Thank you. So now I'm telling a story about Richard. It's not completely true what he said. Uh, <laughs> astronomers come to him desperate because there's not enough money to run all those things. And cryptography is a big business. So they want help to transform these celestial mechanics this ideas into ways to send codes or to protect it's codes. A, this, and, this you know, way. who knows? That's a, a way to, to a lot of money. I just try to play. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Okay. Okay, finished. All right, so little picture on where that came from. Okay, I just want to draw you a little picture of how she got these, a little idea of what Rick and her did. Um, Rick and Nai Chia Chen and I had something to do with this. If the masses are equal, there's a threefold symmetry. Uh, you can see it there. I want you to now imagine planes orthogonal to the, the syzygy plane uh, cutting across. And I want to take one, 
the one that goes through the ray marked one. And I'm going to do that cross section for you. I'm going to draw it. It looks like this. So here's the hill boundary. Here's triple collision. This is binary collision. On the other side, over here is uh, what we call Euler. It just means uh, if I took a point there, it means the configuration looks like this. The whole picture here, this whole thing, is the isosceles three-body problem viewed in shape space. That cut. Those are invariant submanifolds. I want to, so we're just looking in those. Those are two degree of freedom subsystems. And uh, right, so the original one, the, with the, the first animation I showed you, it starts on the hill boundary. It does like that. It bounces. This is a levy chiva to regularization, analytic regularization. It bounces. It's gone, it's gone Euler. It comes back. The key is hitting here perpendicular. You hit here perpendicular, you've got a reflection symmetry, and you bounce. So that's what that orbit was doing in shape space. Uh, that would be all three collapsing. No, no, because over this do with the fingers. It's <laughs> this arc, this arc is going like this. Collision, bounce. Here, can you see my fingers from there? Start like this. Collision, bounce. This guy gets sucked down, goes, crosses, re reverses, stops, repeats. Okay? That's what it's doing. So uh, some open questions about, all right, so the, the, I said, I used the word Jacobi Mappertui, and I said Jair was helpful with this. Um, I ne we, ne we never used the Jacobi Mappertui in doing this. We kind of used it for inspiration, uh, to think about the geometry, but we never actually used it. That's for total, that's, this, has, this has angular momentum zero. But there's no collapse involved here. There's no, Sundman is for total collapse. There's no triple collision here. Sundman is when all three of them, yeah. Okay, so I just leave, end with a few open questions. Uh, how do you get the instanton from mechanics? I would like to, that would be fun, huh? I'm a, you know, this is again, a bit of a, how do they say, hammer in search of a nail. I mean, I like the math. You give me the problem. Um, and that's, I don't want that. I'm going to stop. Um, and happy birthday, Jair. <laughs>